Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Let's begin the program. All right. Well, you're all having a great time. It's wonderful to see so many people here, some uh, friendly faces, people I know, and new people. So welcome to the uh, International Sculpture Center Lifetime Achievement Award. For those of you that don't know me, I am Johanna Hutchison, the Executive Director, and I've been with the ISC now for 10 years. And if you, thank you. <laughs> For those of you who don't know much about the ISC, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction. We're a nonprofit arts organization that was formed in 1960. And our mission is to advance the creation and understanding of sculpture and its unique and vital contribution to society. We currently have around 8,000 members and subscribers, and our members consist of artists, art historians, galleries, museums, curators, anybody that's interested in sculpture. I work with a wonderful board. Many of them are here today, past board members too. We have our chairman of the board, our board, and a past chairman of the board. So if you can just stand, please. They're, they're a wonderful group to work with. They provide vision, guidance, and support, and I really enjoy working with them. So the ISC was formed to achieve the following goals. To expand public understanding and appreciation of sculpture internationally. To demonstrate the power of sculpture to educate and effect social change. To engage artists and art professionals in a dialogue to advance the art form and to promote a supportive environment for sculpture and sculptors. So how do we fulfill our mission? Well, we publish Sculpture Magazine. Many people know the magazine before they know the ISC, but that is one of our programs. And in 2006, we inaugurated ISC Press and started publishing books, and we published our fifth book this year. And through our website, we're the virtual resource center for sculpture and sculptors. We get over 100,000 hits a day and have member area uh, with resource, director, resource directories. And through conferences and symposiums. The ISC first grew out of a symposium in 19, that was held in 1960 in Lawrence, Kansas. And since then, we've held uh, 26 other educational events, bringing together art community for unique networking experiences. This year, in February, we held a conference in New Zealand, and we have another one in Miami in December. And then also through our recognition programs. First, there's the Educator Award. We recently awarded Wayne Potratz of the University of Minnesota. And the Patron Award was most recently given to Olga Hershorn, and the Outstudying Stu Student Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture Award. Was, which was given to 20 students and five honorable mentions this year. And there's a show opening of their work at Grounds for Sculpture this month. And then of course, our most prestigious award, the Lifetime Achievement Award. That's the reason that we're all here today. Our recipients this year are in very good company. Past winners are Magdalena Abakanowicz, Fletcher Benton, Fernando Batero, Louise Bourgeois, Sir Anthony Caro, Elizabeth Catlett, John Chamberlain, Eduardo Chalida, Christo and Jean-Claude, Philip King, William King, it's a long list, Manuel Neri, Mark de Suvero, Klaus Oldenburg and Kuji Van Bruggen, Nam June Pike, Arnaldo Pomodoro, Gio Pomodoro, Robert Rauschenberg, George Rickey, George Siegel, Kenneth Snelson, Frank Stella, and William Tucker. That's the list, right? I would now like to introduce Mark LeBaron, Chairman of the Board, who will be our Master of Ceremonies. Well, Johanna, thank you. And, um, 
For all of you that have met Johanna, you know Johanna is really the brains and the spunk behind this organization. Please give Johanna and the staff a round of applause. Thank you. Today marks the 22nd anniversary of our gala and celebration of sculpture. The highlight of our gala is the pre presentation of the Lifetime Achievement Award, and we've been honored, as Johanna said, to recognize many of the greatest sculptors since we started this in 1991. Tonight, we present the award to Nancy Holt and Beverly Pepper, whose vast contributions to art span more than five decades. The ISC Board of Directors established the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1991 to recognize individual sculptures who have made exemplary contributions to the field of sculpture. Candidates are masters of the sculptural process and techniques who have devoted their careers to a laudable body of work as well as to achievement of the field as a whole. When selecting a Lifetime Achievement Award winner, the attributes that we look at are quality of the work, impact and influence of the work, sense of dedication and commitment to the field of sculpture, and a spirit of generosity, and spirit of generosity with other sculptors. Tonight, we recognize two artists that are exemplary um, examples of those attributes. So please recognize them again. These are great. Now, at, at this time, I'd like to um, take just a moment and thank some of the uh, people that have supported ISC and made this event possible. Uh, our sponsors tonight are Ms. Donald Fisher, Andrew Gunluck, the Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundation, the BWF Foundation, Digital Adelier, Fran and Barry Wessler, Seward Johnson, Johnson Art and Education Foundation, Joseph Kerniski, Cantor Family Foundation, Marlboro Gallery, and Marina Marshall Kogan. Please recognize our sponsors for tonight. I'd like to take just uh, a quick commercial break here. Uh, you've heard about the ISC and the great things that we do to support sculpture. Uh, clearly, we'd love to have all of your support. I think at the tables tonight, there are uh, cards, a pledge card, uh, that we would hope people would sign up. And if you're not a member, become a member of ISC. Uh, certainly consider supporting ISC to some degree. Uh, we love to do this mission, and we, wanna, we hope we can continue to do that in the future. Now, one, I've got just a couple other quick things. Uh, we, we'd like to recognize five board members uh, who are retiring or will retire at the end of this year. Uh, some are here, so let's, once I read all the names, let's give them a round of applause. Um, Bob Edwards, Ralfonso Gershwind, Paul Hubbard, Creighton Michael, and Mark Lyman. Please thank these people for their service. And as, as people leave, new people join. And that's always the case. We have some new ISC board members. Uh, Jeff Fleming is the director of the Des Moines Art Center and brings years of curatorial and exhibition experience to the board. Prescott Muir, although he's served now for a year, this is his first gala, is the principal of an award-winning architectural firm and a professor and director of the School of Architecture at the University of Utah. And Andrew Rogers, an Australian artist, exhibits internationally and his critically acclaimed sculptures and photographs are in numerous private and prominent public collections in Australia and around the world. Frank Sippel, a real estate entrepreneur with companies in Switzerland and Germany, will be joining the board. And uh, our newest member is Ivana Starsky. Ivana is deeply involved in promoting Polish culture and Polish artists who live abroad. So the ISC extends a warm welcome to all these new board members. We look forward to working with them. Thank you all for joining us at uh, this event. Please enjoy your dinner in the evening at the beautiful Tribeca 360. We'll begin the awards program shortly. Thank you. Hello. 
I can tell that uh, everyone's having a great time, and that's why we're here tonight, to have a great time. So I hate to be the one to interrupt, but uh, we need to get on and get started with our awards presentation. So if I can have your attention. I have had a couple people ask me if you have filled out one of the cards and uh, you want to support the ISC, uh, Johanna or one of the staff can come around and pick them up or if you'll just drop them off or bring them up to the front table and, and uh, whatever you'd like to do, we appreciate that. All right, I would like to uh, get the program going here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Tufnell. Okay, can we have it quiet, please? Thank you. I want to do a proper introduction here. Um, ben Tufnell is a curator and writer based in London. He was a curator at the Tate Britain from 1997 to 2006 and director of exhibitions at Haunch of Venison from 2006 to 2013. At Haunch of Venison, Ben worked closely with numerous artists, including James Rosenquist and Richard Long. In 2012, he curated Nancy Holt's first UK exhibition, titled Photo Works at the Haunch of Venison, London. In recent years, Ben has curated ex exhibitions at museums, including Tate Stain Ives, MUAC in Mexico City, and, South, and the South African National Gallery. He has recently co-curated a major survey exhibition, Uncommon Ground, Land Art in Britain, 1966 through 1979, which is currently touring four British museums. He is the author of Land Art and the editor, editor of Richard Long's Selected Statements and Interviews. He has contributed essays to publications on numerous artists. Ben Tufnell is a founding director of Paraffin. Please join me in welcoming Ben Tufnell. Please come forward. Good evening, everyone. I'm British. I hope you can understand what I'm going to say. Um, it's a huge honor for me to be invited to speak at this event. And it's been a huge honor for me to work closely with Nancy for these last few years. And above all, it is a huge honor for me to be able to call her my friend. We first met in Karlsruhe in Germany in January 2011 when her retrospective exhibition Sightlines opened there. I was pretty starstruck, I have to say. She's a member of that great generation of artists who changed forever the way in which we understand what art is and can be. She was at the epicenter of a revolution from the mid-60s onwards, the legacy of which still defines much art made today. So I was a little in awe meeting her. But Nancy is great company. She likes to laugh, and she has some wonderful stories to tell. I quickly understood that she is a very generous person, and I have seen since then that she gives of herself endlessly to curators and academics, to writers and scholars, to her audience. Importantly, she understands that she has an audience. And she is also a perfectionist. All of these characteristics have enabled her to make the kind of work that she has made, to create large-scale permanent constructions in public spaces, to get a construction crew out into the middle of the desert, to turn a sand quarry into an artwork. Such things require an extraordinary degree of commitment. It requires diplomacy, ambition, self-belief, persistence, vision, bravery, spirit. Nancy possesses all of these qualities in abundance. For more than 40 years, she has developed a wide-ranging yet remarkably consistent body of work in a diverse range of media. Site-specific sculpture in both urban and remote landscapes, 
temporary gallery installations involving sighting devices, mirrors and lights, heating and ventilation systems, but also drawings, films, texts, audio works and photography. She is perhaps best known as a pioneer of land art, the creator of one of the iconic American art, artworks of that genre, the Sun Tunnels. But she is also a pioneer of public art. Her groundbreaking projects in this vein, which engage hundreds if not thousands of members of the public on a daily basis and which will continue to do so, include pieces as varied as stone enclosure, rock rings at the Western Washington University, Dark Star Park in Virginia, Up and Under, a project in Finland that took over 10 years to realize, and most recently, the Avignon Locators, inaugurated only last year in Avignon in France. Nancy is also a pioneer of film and video as a medium for art. In fact, we might say that she is an artist who has not been constrained by any kind of definition as to what it is that an artist does. Yet despite ranging across many subjects and working in a wide variety of media, her work is immediately recognizable. Her sensibility is distinctive. It connects her films, photographic images, and her site-specific sculptures, so that we might speak of a Holtian mode, one that places emphasis on the mechanisms of perception, on ideas about place and time and consciousness, and in particular, a profound sense of cosmic relativity. The Holtian mode changes the way we view the world. I know that is a big statement to make, but it is one I believe to be true. Having engaged with Nancy's work, her locators, for example, the simple act of looking through a window will never be the same again. Last year, Nancy's traveling retrospective opened at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts in Salt Lake City. As part of the opening events, the museum organized for a group of friends, curators, artists, and collectors to head out into the desert and accompany Nancy first to the spiral jetty and then to the sun tunnels. I had the opportunity to go, and it was an amazing experience. A journey to another America and a revelation of the possibilities of landscape art. Set in a landscape that is immense, spare, and sublime, the sun tunnels is a beautiful work of art, rich in ideas, powerful, tough, and uncompromising, yet generous, too. There is power here, a concentration that reminded me of sites such as Stonehenge or Avebury back in England. Exploring the four great concrete tubes arranged in an open X, one becomes finally attuned to subtle shifts in light and atmosphere. Everything is changing, always. The tunnels frame and section the landscape and direct the gaze. Yet they also connect one to a larger cosmic reality. They are aligned in pairs along the axes of the rising and setting sun on the summer and winter solstices. There, one truly stands on the surface of the planet as it spins through space and time. We watch the sunset of lilac, pink, and purple shade to silver and stone, and then there was, as there usually is, a general agreement that we needed a drink. The nearest watering hole is the Cowboy Bar in Montello, just over the border in Nevada, about an hour's drive away. It's a real cowboy bar, full of real cowboys. And as an Englishman, I approached that place with some trepidation. It was karaoke night. <laughs> and my nervousness was only increased by the request that I get up and sing something by the Beatles. <laughs> In the bar, drinks were bought, and something happened. Word got around that Miss Holt was in the house, and a queue of weather-beaten cowboys formed, all wanting to shake her hand and pay their respects. 
There was none of the negativity that sometimes greets contemporary art when it mixes with the general public. The boys were big fans. Some wanted to share memories of the building of the tunnels when Nancy lived out in the desert in a VW camper van. What became very clear was that the cowboys regarded the tunnels as their artwork. They were fiercely proud of it and told us how visitors from Japan and Germany and elsewhere regularly stopped by to ask for directions. The Sun Tunnels has been adopted. In a way, it is no longer Nancy's work. It belongs to everyone out there and by extension to us all. Again, a revelation. I can think of no better way of illustrating how Nancy Holt's art has the power to touch people. And because of this, I can think of no artist more deserving of this award. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. I just have a greeting to read out for Nancy. Um, from Whitney Tassie, the curator of modern and contemporary art, and Gretchen Dietrichs, the executive director. Greetings from Salt Lake City, Utah, and from all your friends at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts and the University of Utah. Congratulations on receiving the International Sculpture Center's Lifetime Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture Award. It is a truly remarkable achievement and so well deserved. What you have done for sculpture, public art, and art making in general over the last 40 years deserves proper recognition. You're a trailblazing pioneer and we love and admire you. So sorry that we can't be, without, can't be with you tonight to celebrate. The Utah Museum of Fine Arts sends you so much good cheer and admiration from Salt Lake City. overwhelmed by Ben's uh, talk and um, just want to say there are so many people here tonight who have supported me over the years and <clears throat> now I'm very moved by this. Uh, you know, working on the fringes of the art world, I've needed a lot of support from people who were willing to um, see outside of the general structure of the art world and uh, and we had to invent ways <coughs> sorry uh, we had to investigate and invent uh, new ways of doing things so the people who and you all know who you are uh, who have supported me and helped me over the years uh, have entered into an unknown area where we had to um, feel our way. And that took uh, an extra amount of um, vision or uh, and uh, uh, support um, by the people around me who helped me. So I thank you very much. <clears throat> and I also thank the uh, International Sculpture Center 
who have been playing a role in my life right along. In 1980, they invited me to be part of a conference in Washington, D.C. And it was also an opportunity for me to make a work uh, through their auspices in Washington, in Presidential Park, across from the Corcoran Museum. Uh, the work was inside out. It was the first time I used, or one of the first times I used wrought iron. And I made a dome structure with a hole in the center, and I was able to watch the sun shine through the structure and create patterns on the ground. That was key to my doing another work called Annual Ring in Saginaw, Michigan, uh, the same year. And uh, that one was uh, aligned with the sun on the solstices so that a circle of light filled a ring on the ground on the summer solstice when the sun was at the highest point in the sky. I really wouldn't probably have done that work if I hadn't done Inside Out. So Inside Out was critical and it was done for the International Sculpture Center. The work was supposedly temporary and like quite a few other works I've done for uh, transient situations, I built it so strong uh, that it uh, lasted and uh, nobody wanted to get rid of it. So it remained uh, in Presidential Park, which is sort of a place that you can't do anything uh, without the okay of the president. And uh, it, did, it did remain for about 20 years. And eventually when the park uh, director retired, uh, it w had to be removed, but still it had a long life and many visitors to Washington, D.C. Uh, had a chance to experience my work and many photographs were taken. It was a work that kind of induced photography. So you'll see pictures of it all over the internet. Uh, people and their families going to uh, this particular site and it became a kind of a focus and also it was the first time that I would realize that I should be considering my works as they're seen from cars going by. So I, I in the next in a work I did up in uh, for the to for the uh, 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid, I did a work that <clears throat> where I, that was part of the consciousness of building the work was how you would see it as you went down John Brown Road to another road. And uh, it had a, a kind of um, cinematic quality, you know, how you see things as you move. Also, the International Sculpture Center, through their magazine Sculpture, has always reviewed my major works. And that is sort of a, when I look at it now, because of this event this evening, I was thinking, how, how did the center play a role? And it was always like the fallback. You know, like if I did a work, I knew that I would be reviewed in Sculpture Magazine and maybe you know, nowhere else right away. You know, it sometimes took a while for my works to be reviewed. But they were, seemed to be there. Uh, and they do give a firm support to the endeavor of sculpture. And when I say sculpture, uh, it is a word I've used for myself over the years, and I realize it is the expansive word. 
If you say you're a painter, it's very limited. You are really stuck with your medium. But being a sculptor, you can breathe. You can do conceptual art, you can do video, you can do film, you can do land art, you can do installation pieces, you can do traditional sculpture. So I uh, felt that freedom that the International Sculpture Center supports, uh, and I'm very glad that they exist. Thank you, and thank you for this meeting. Congratulations again, Nancy, and, and Ben, thank you for your comments. Uh, I think we could spool up the music if you'd like to do some karaoke here for the group. Uh, <laughs> later, okay. Well, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, jo Joseph Betchner. Uh, Joseph Betchner is the founding director and curator of the sculpture program at the Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He currently serves as Chief Curator and Vice President of Collections and Exhibitions. In addition, he is the Lena Meyer Professor in the History and Art at Aquinas College and teaches courses in Renaissance, Modern, and Contemporary Art. Joe has authored numerous books and articles and has curated many exhibitions on the modern and contemporary Renaissance and Baroque periods. Most recently, he has organized exhibitions of Amy Planza, Jonathan Brofsky, Andy Goldsworthy, Beverly Pepper, Mark DeSuvero, Henry Moore, George Segal, and Richard Hunt, among others. He has served on numerous civic art advisory committees, including those which commissioned major public works by Dennis Oppenheim and Maya Lin. He recently served as chair of the National Committee to commission a sculpture of President Gerald R. Ford for the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Um, he serves as, on the executive board of the Midwest Art History Society and advisory boards for the School of Art of Chicago's Oxbrow Program and the International Sculpture Center. In addition, he authors a monthly column on the visual arts for the Grand Rapids Magazine. Please welcome me in, rec in um, joining here up here, Joseph. Joseph, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Congratulations, Nancy. Being and becoming. Each of us is born with certain characteristics, traits that define our being, our bag of goods, as it were. Each of us follows a life path full of curves and straights, opportunities and obstacles that in our ability to navigate and even conquer, aid us in the art of becoming. Our lives, then, a continuum of being and becoming. With grace and grit, acumen and sweat, humor and humanity, few have mastered the art of being and becoming with greater intelligence and tenacity than Beverly Pepper. Born Beverly Stoll in Brooklyn, New York, she admiringly shares that she had the most extraordinary family of strong, independent, and liberated women in the form of her mother and grandmother. Her grandparents fled Vilnius, Lithuania, not because of pogroms or prejudice, but because of political activism against the Tsar. 
Her mother adored Roosevelt, detested Franco, and worked for the NAACP. From conviction came opportunity, and for us the occasion to wonder if courage is inherited or learned behavior. At age six, she took a dollar from her mother's purse and went to the corner candy store, bypassed all the confections that would have slowed other children, and bought a box of colored pencils. Her father called her a thief and brutally beat her so she couldn't go to school until the welts healed. Rather than disparage him, she divorced herself from him and recognized liberation and independence. Who knew that from a box of colored pencils, you could begin to craft a coat of steel, being and becoming. Academically gifted, she graduated high school at 16 and desired to become an artist. Against the background of the depression and the impending war, her mother wanted something practical for her daughter. Beverly convinced her mother that starving artist was not a hyphenated word, and she found her way to Pratt studying advertising because it was practical rather than painting as she desired. At Pratt, she was drawn to the rigors of industrial design, was the only woman in the class, but was denied a major because they feared that women would be unable to handle heavy equipment. How could have they known that this particular young woman would spend a lifetime on the floors of factories and foundries? The dark side of Pratt came in the form of an invitation to join a sorority, which initially elevated Beverly, only to crush her when it was rescinded because the girls discovered she was Jewish. She went to the dean for clarity, but he advised her to remain silent not because of the sorority, but because Pratt at that time had a 1% quota for Jews and for New Yorkers, and that because she hadn't studied art in high school, her position in the school may be in jeopardy. Terrified her mother might discover such prejudices and remove her, she remained silent, working hard and moving on. Silence could mean strength and lead to victory, being and becoming. Beverly found work in advertising and quickly became a successful art director in Manhattan. Yet the desire to be an artist, specifically to paint, reemerged. She heard about opportunities for study in Paris and audaciously left her family, her career, her prescribed future. For a woman alone in 1949, setting sail into the unknown was not poetic metaphor, but daunting prose. In Paris, she studied with La Haute, Leger, watched Zadkin work, and came to know the efforts of Picasso, Gonzalez, and Giacometti. In addition to these old masters of the new, there was Bill Pepper, a young prodigy of equal measure to Beverly. In many ways, their life's joint adventure began as he took her from one museum to the next. The Renaissance, the medieval, the Etruscan unfolded. The Peppers eventually settled in Rome, for the better part of a decade, Beverly painted in a figurative manner, found a gallery, and success. However, felled trees in their garden helped reorient her towards sculpture and liberated her from figuration. Absent knowledge of traditional carving techniques, she bought grinders, buzz saws, and drills, the very tools girls from Pratt theoretically couldn't handle. She was encouraged by the legendary art historian Leonello Venturi and captured critical acclaim. Divine intervention seems once again to have cast itself across the eternal city, this time to guide a young mother transplanted from Brooklyn. Immediately thereafter, she was contacted by Giovanni Carendente, who asked if she could weld. Why, she countered, rather than admitting she could not. When he explained he was organizing an enormous exhibition which would allow select sculptors the opportunity to work in steel factories across Italy, she ignored, ignored present reality and said, yes. Where, then she asked herself, where to learn to weld? The answer came in the form of Rome's dwindling street artisans, specifically an ironmonger who taught her to bend metal and to weld. And in short order, she found her way to the factory floor as did another young American, David Smith. David became her dear friend and colleague. 
Kerendente's resulting exhibition was the 1962 Sculpture in the City, part of the renowned Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto. It's one of the epic events in the history of contemporary sculpture. Who was shown? David Smith, Alexander Calder, Arnoldo Pomodoro, Lynn Chadwick, and Beverly Pepper, the only woman. Against the backdrop of such cultural history, have why and where and the resulting who ever felt more potent in one narrative? Being and becoming. Ever inquisitive yet not overconfident, Pepper went on to explore stainless steel and Corten. With the latter, she's likely to have been the first sculptor to explore this industrial weather-resistant material that completely transformed architecture and engineering, but more poignantly, the history of contemporary sculpture. She was also drawn to iron, at once so primitive yet industrial. She labored over forging and casting. When John Deere, yes, the John Deere of Moline, Illinois, called to ask Beverly if she would come and speak at their foundry, she said yes, but only if they would let her work there. She was fascinated with the opportunity to work with ductile iron, which John Deere had invented. In Moline, she furthered her admiration for tools, not merely as functional objects, but as inspirational forms. The famed Moline markers, one of seminal mo monuments of her vast and inspiring repertoire, are a result. Here, one feels the reverberations of vindications for the young woman who was denied the opportunity to study industrial design. Although Beverly's efforts have populated galleries and museums across the United States and Europe, hers is not an oeuvre that can be contained by the precincts of the illustrious white cube. The monumental demanded the out of doors to be satiated, but also to contribute to the larger overarching history of art. Roman scale, medieval majesty, Eastern elegance gave rise to a decidedly unique contemporary vision and voice. Wielding the confidence and profundity of abstraction while managing the rigors of materials and engineering and site specificity, she has emerged as one of the most important public sculptors of our time. Her wedges and markers are icons for communities near and far. Factor in her elegiac earthworks, amphitheaters, land sculptures, and the immensity of her repertoire justifiably overwhelms. Reach has never been overreach. Scale never out of scale. How can it be that timeliness dissolves immediately into timelessness? Once in our many years of friendship and countless hours of interviews, I made the mistake of using the phrase woman sculptor. I was promptly, shall we say, corrected as Beverly explained that she did not believe that the word woman was an adjective. <laughs> Embarrassed by this slip, my only solace was that I was in parallel company with her mother who years before had lost the debate over starving artist. Recognizing the importance of feminism and acknowledging that there are women who make feminist sculpture, Beverly wants to be recognized for her work, period, and what work she has done. To the surprise of many, including oftentimes herself, Beverly Pepper crossed into the new millennium with vigor and vision. She still thrives in the studio, on the site, and yes, even the factory floor. Certainly the personnel and the locations have changed, and many beloved, but perhaps more importantly for her, trusted friends have departed. Yet she stands centered smiling on but not distracted by the past. The future holds too much promise, being and becoming. Yet for all that has been said and has been written about Beverly Pepper, the depth and dimensions of her being were for me captured during our many conversations following her fall and convalescence last year. Softly she would say, who's gonna look after Bill? Was he eating properly? His new book is just fabulous, you know. Isn't it wonderful how John is flourishing in Sicily? Wonder how Jory is really feeling. 
I can tell you Peter's last show was terrific. What did the future hold for her grandson still in school? Wasn't Emily's work noble, but could she support herself? California is so expensive. How were her assistants? How were her friends? Family, all in but name. When I tried to direct the conversation towards her and her healing, Beverly only wanted to discuss her new sculpture in getting back in the studio, which she has. Even last week when we spoke, she was fretting about leaving the studio to come to New York. The sculpture was going so well, she had to make ready for new shows on the horizon, new commissions. Being and becoming Beverly Pepper is a narrative no one could invent. Intelligence into action, adversity into victory, opportunity into history. Hers is the self-determined fullness of a career continuing to unfold, of a life being fully lived. Being and becoming have justifiably merged beyond repertoire into legend. Beverly, you are deservedly lauded and loved. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Joe. A few people wrote in. They were very sad that they couldn't attend. Uh, Maria Grazia Machetti Lungarotti sends, and her family send their congratulations. Adele Chatfield Taylor said, what a wonderful occasion. Beverly certainly belongs in that star-studded company and we send heartfelt congratulations to this wonderful recognition. And Wendy Watson is very sorry that she couldn't be here. She's in Italy at the moment. So thank you. Please come up, Beverly. Joe, you were a good choice. <laughs> I mean, I can't get over it. I'd like to beat Beverly Pepper. <laughs> it's astonishing. <laughs> but I have nothing to say after Joe. I wouldn't think of competing with his description. So I would like to tell you how overwhelmed I am and how moved I am to see so many friends over so many decades that it was worth living to be this age. <laughs> I have friends who are so young they could be my grandchildren. And I am the oldest person I know, except for my husband. And he doesn't realize how old he is. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. It's amazing to look out here and see my history. I mean, in this audience is a young man named Steve Bickley. In 1974, Steve Bickley showed up at my doorstep in Todi, which we had no way to get there by, except by car, he and another young man. He was studying sculpture in Cortona, and he said he was in the neighborhood and would like to wanted to meet me. I noticed that he didn't have a car that they got there without a car. And we sat, I let him in, I was alone. He might have been Jack the Ripper before I knew. <laughs> but someone who wanted to talk about my work, how could I refuse to let them in? That's one of the things about sculpture, you must understand risk. It's where the risk of whether you're gonna be Jack the Ripper or fall off a scaffolding. <laughs> but this young man, with the other man, who's, I must say, I don't even remember his name, but they stayed, Steve stayed a year. They moved in. 
<laughs> what was so interesting about, I'm supposed to be so savvy, such a New Yorker, I asked for references. So he gave me the number in Georgia. <laughs> I'm in Todi, Italy. And I call Georgia, and they give me great references. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I was so overwhelmed at how wonderfully they spoke about Steve, I said, stay. Well, Steve stayed a number of years. <laughs> it was one of the most wonderful, he still is, he's here, but most wonderful human beings I had ever met, a young sculptor who, to my shock, in the years he spent with me making huge steel sculptures, his work looked like Nancy Graves. I kept saying, Steel, Steve, what are you doing? You're working with me and you're making flowers? <laughs> you know? He's here tonight. He came to Italy to help me install huge sculptures. He's still there as my dependable, great friend who I trust. And I'm so overwhelmed that he came tonight. But I'm also overwhelmed about all the good friends I see. Of course, you know, if you're going to be 90, almost 91 in a week, in a month, you have a lot of dead friends who don't show up. <laughs> it never occurred to me to outlive all these people. I always expected they'd stay around and take care of me. I mean, the fact that I now have to take care of other people is very disturbing. <laughs> The nice thing about being an artist is you always think that people, my children think that I'm not very smart, that, I'm, that, that I, I need help all the time, I'm some, this fragile thing. They always check on me to make sure that my mind isn't going. I don't know where it's going, but it's certainly not going the direction they worry about. <laughs> <laughs> But I want to welcome you, my great friends, my loyal, loyal friends, who, some of them I've known for such a long time. Doris Fisher is here. Doris Fisher and her husband, her wonderful husband, Don, showed up in Italy. When I was, in, she was sent there by a man named Nathan Culloden, one of the really great human beings who worked for Andre Emmerich, who died too early. But I was in America, so Dara shows up with Don, and they go along, and Bill, who very enthusiastic, becomes great friends and takes him around to see my sculpture, and they buy a sculpture, which eventually they sold immediately because they bought one that wasn't as good as the most of the ones they have of mine. But in spite of all this, we have made close, close friends, and Doris is here tonight. We miss Don. We, you know, I'm so overwhelmed that she has come for this occasion. And there are so many other people here. I can't really start Doris in front of me so I can start with her, but I can't go through the whole list. I want to thank you all. I think there is nothing better in life than good, loyal friends. And I want to thank you for all coming tonight. Thank you. So before we leave, and you don't have to leave yet, um, I just want to say a few thank yous. Thank you once again to my wonderful board. They are amazing to work with. Thank you to our performers tonight, the Pepper Brothers, Beverly's grandchildren. <laughs> Thank you to our speakers, Ben Tufnell and Joe Becker.
thank you to the ISC staff. We're very small, we work very hard, and a special thank you to Erin Gauchy, Conference and Events Manager, and April Morehouse, our Conference and Events Coordinator. Thank you to everybody else that I've worked with to make this event come off tonight. And finally, thank you to all of you for attending. You've made it a very special evening for both Nancy and Beverly and for the ISC. We want, the, the ISC would like to thank you for supporting the event tonight and for supporting the ISC in general. And we ask if you're able to use the pledge card and make a donation to the ISC. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you and congratulations to Nancy Lee and Beverly. Thank you and have a great night.